it's officially 9 30. um so okay uh, we are making history again today as we always make history every day so great morning to everyone and uh, welcome to today's interview with honorable dr brian walker i'm kimi del prado of green tigers journal and sensible philippines and i will be your moderator for today um, so a little background on our distinguished guest for today, who is currently traveling in space. Dr. Brian Walker was a medical practitioner before entering politics at the 2021 Western Australian state election. He was elected to the Western Australian Legislative Council as a legalized cannabis Western Australia member for the East Metropolitan Region. His term commenced on May 24th of 2021. But before we proceed, I'd like to introduce the person responsible for this opportunity to get to know Dr. Brian further. So I'd like to call in Mr. Ramon Granados of Hemp Engineering. He is responsible for the recent Hemp Expos, particularly the Hemp Home Expo and the Hemp Textile Expo. And we have another one coming, the US Hemp Home Expo. His passion sparked a series of initiatives that is currently gathering like-minded people determined to change the world for good. Um, so Ramon is uh, the CEO of Hemp Engineering and advisor of several other companies in the U.S. and South America. He is ambassador for the Latin Industrial Hemp Association to Austral Australasia region. He has gathered a team of scientists, engineers, and architects from around the world. Hemp Engineering is currently working in projects in Sydney, Malaysia, Canada, Uruguay, and Puerto Rico. And he is now... Um, uh, he is going to build uh, a smart hemp city very soon. So I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Ramon, Mr. Hemp Granados to the floor. Welcome, Ramon, and good, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kimi. You are always very uh, <laughs> um, eloquent in your introductions, which I love. <laughs> Mr. Brian, thank you very much for attending this call. And it's a Good great pleasure morning. for me to have you in this show and, and sharing the audience of advocates um, and other personalities around the world. It's and good to see you. I call you a brother. <laughs> I know we're brothers. <laughs> I met Mr. Brian over Mr. Simon Ray uh, some time ago. And uh, the friendship has been there. The main interest that has kept us together has uh, been um, kept alive, even though we haven't met each, uh, each other for uh, personally for some time. But um, the same question that I asked you when I met you uh, is how did you end up in the, what, what caught you, your interest to come in the, in this new emerging industry in the hemp business and end oh. up being elected as the first democratically elected parliamentarian in the whole world. This is no joke. It's a well, life in the darkness. Well, technically I wasn't the first, I was the second because Sophia Mormond was the first. Uh, and in fact, she's the first uh, as, a, as a woman also in Western Australian uh, politics. Um, and she is uh, also leading the way. I, I, I followed on at the same election, of course. But how did I get into this? Well, I've been a heretic, a medical heretic for most of my clinical life. I really don't like what doctors do. I mean, doctors, uh, the, the medicines that we prescribe can be number three or number four cause of death in the world. Uh, simply with the drugs that we prescribe, we don't look at causes. We give a diagnosis and give a pill to manage the diagnosis. We don't fix the cause. Well, unless you, you're getting an operation to, to, to fix a problem being hit by a taxi. But most of our illnesses are chronic disease illnesses, autoimmune diseases, and we've got no idea how they've happened or what we can do about them. Diabetes, for example, no idea. And the pain you get from diabetes when it's advanced can be horrible. How do you fix that? Well, actually, cannabis is a wonderful fix for that. Uh, what about rheumatoid arthritis? Cannabis will do that wonderfully. What about anxiety? Uh, and uh, we, we're giving people drugs which are very potent uh, and uh, make you very ill indeed, but cannabis can do a wonderful job there as well. Now, I'm not saying cannabis is a universal panacea, but it's a medicine, it's a natural medicine, it's a safe medicine. It's far safer than most of the medicines I can prescribe. So how come it was banned and I mean, shouldn't do this? On the other hand, as doctors, we can give any amount of heroin and no one bats an eyelid. 
So th this this uh, uh, confronted me, and uh, I decided long ago that I'm not going to do this. So cannabis for me was an, a natural uh, uh, progression. Just treating people uh, safely, treating people uh, with with uh, responsibility, uh, but not actually poisoning my patients, which is unusual, I know, but I like that. So getting into politics, well, this mindset, prescribing cannabis, I'm an authorized prescriber. I saw the legalized cannabis WA party had started. And I said, okay, I want to know about this. So I did volunteer it and lo and behold, here I am in politics having a ball because no, no, not just in my own room in my clinic, one-on-one -on -one with a patient. Now I can speak to a larger audience and now I can get things moving. Like for example, the select committee I shall, I shall hopefully shortly be chairing. So things are moving and I'm just so delighted that I can be part of this movement. So I guess that with that background and that in interesting introduction to the um, cannabis world, <clears throat> your experience and understanding of the prohibition is, is <clears throat> a singular um, perspective, I believe. And I can only talk as an engineer, I can only talk as a Latino, uh, the Latino community was targeted uh, initially as the black community as the um, <clears throat> uh, object of discrimination and the justification of the prohibitions of something that um, uh, uh, is overwhelmingly um, ignorance. But uh, the, the, the component of the marijuana was to you know, to leave the prohibition was not the, after several studies of more qualified people than myself, has led us to understand that it was never uh, uh, the intention to, to make the prohibition from the marijuana. It was, the marijuana was basically used because what they, what they were targeting was to benefit the corporations of the time <clears throat> so that they can, so they couldn't have competition from what the um, um, what was being discovered and the technologies that were being applied to compete with the steel industry, the paper industry, the paper, the cotton industry, um, primarily the medicine industry. Um, I believe that uh, on that regard, uh, the provision in it's, it's very interesting uh, listening you as a as a doctor and and now as a uh, as a politician official politician um, how how are we going to do to overcome and make our uh, politicians body to understand that hemp is the way that the, our politicians cannot simply just follow 80 years of uh, prohibition that doesn't have any scientist and, 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 and uh, justification of any kind. So the science is being led by a wrong law that is affecting potentially a, a large uh, industry that can work uh, and in, post-COVID uh, era and change literally the war. Oh, but the cannabis industry is a lot bigger than people think. Uh, people called me the hemp doctor, the weed doctor, or the pot doctor uh, going into, into, uh, into parliament because they had no idea of what's actually involved. Now, I've spoken about the medical uses for, for cannabis. And as a doctor, of course, this was my first, uh, uh, first understanding. There was no medical justification whatsoever for ban banning cannabis. Now, I have to say, I never used the word marijuana. That was an FBI concocted word, uh, Maria Juanita, to uh, allow them to make it sound Latino so they could then persecute Hispanics. They could persecute the blacks for, for using cannabis and they diverted the FBI agents away from stopping alcohol running <clears throat> into stopping uh, um, uh, cannabis, but also opening the doors to abusing, to uh, persecuting minorities. It later became <clears throat> useful as a tool to persecute the hippies who were against the Vietnam War. You could call them anti-American 
uh, cannabis smoking uh, enemies of the state and therefore you can arrest them, therefore you can persecute them. It was never medical. In fact, all the medical advice bar one was that cannabis uh, is, is uh, safe and suitable. Consider also that at that time using mercury was actually part of the, the, the medical treatments for some conditions, very, very toxic. Just 10 years before it was banned, the treatment for asthma was to give a, 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 a cigarette of tobacco laced with a bit of strychnine to manage, can it, to, to manage asthma. Stupid now and uh, toxic, but uh, that, was, that was medicine then. And we've now missed 80 years uh, more of actually understanding how cannabis works. For example, aspirin, the bark of the willow tree, and for many years it was just for taking for headaches until they discovered how safe it are, how effective it is for managing uh, blood clotting and platelets for helping people survive after heart attacks or strokes. Now, cannabis is exactly the same, but much, much more. This is medically. The advances we're making in looking at the subparticles of, of, of cannabis, the terpenes, CBG, for example, is grossly underreported. Uh, could that be useful for, cannab for, for uh, managing epilepsy? Yes, and many more pieces there of information. Your, your terpenes for managing nausea or insomnia. But going on to the broader picture uh, of, of cannabis, uh, the whole hemp plant, it's a multi-billion, well, trillion dollar industry worldwide, which could drastically improve uh, society. Now, in Western Australia, for example, we're looking here at, can we regenerate the blighted land from mining by using hemp? Yes, we can. Can we fight or mine uh, some lithium? Yes, we can. Can we restore the land and give it back to indigenous peoples? Yes, we can. How about if we use the hemp to build um, fire safe buildings uh, in bushfire prone areas? What about if we use that to make a, a place of shelter? You know, this is an Australia, we have bushfires, people die. Uh, can you then create a shelter, a safe shelter of, can of, of hemp, which would allow you to protect your home and when the fire is too close, you can seek safe shelter uh, using a hemp built uh, shelter? Yes, we can. But what about things like uh, making hemp cars, hemp batteries? We could even make hemp boats. I'd love to see, because I'm a sailor, I'd love to see a boat made of hemp. Uh, that's stronger than steel. Uh, in, uh, how about the carbon capture? We could actually uh, generate not just uh, uh, profits for the for the nation, but also we could uh, um, help to make the world a better place. And that really is where we need to be: the sustainable, self-sustainable, uh, 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 ecologically safe uh, approach to helping to regenerate our world, which has been blighted over the last century. So hemp and cannabis, this, this is the future, this is innovative. This is uh, of immense importance to every single one of us. And the idea of focusing, oh, we could smoke THC and maybe get high, big deal, big deal. I mean, 6,000 people every year die in Australia because of alcohol, no one cares. Hemp, zero deaths, okay? So the THC, is, is it a big deal? No, it is not. So we need to open this, uh, and as a politician, my job is to tell people, to explain, to educate how beneficial this can be to everyone from the very top of society, right through all of us, that we can help restore our land, our lands, plural. Uh, so I know in the Philippines, this is going to be starting as well. This can be of immense benefit to the people suffering in poverty who are trying to, to, to live from, from uh, their, their products on the land, this could transform that society and give at least some semblance of wealth to people who have been struggling for a long, long time. So we need this. We all of us need this. When I listen to you, your words resonate in my soul. And I know that if uh, the, assist, the uh, attendees and many others that will listen to you will resonate uh, infinitively because your projects, the projects that you are referring we are already working on them. We are already working in the hemp battery, we're working in plastic hemp, we're working in hempcrete, and I'm not sure if you are fully aware of our progress or what we are after, but yes, we have been working very hard on our team. <laughs> I know that- I look we'll forward to perfect. that so much. I need to invite you, let's have some lunch together in parliament. Ah, oh, oh, uh, oh well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ryan, um, second question is in post post COVID era, where <clears throat> um, the largest corporations are targeting to go the outer space, and 
the government has taken a role to keep the economy up and running. Wouldn't it be smarter for, at least in Western Australia, that our governments focus in financing hemp projects and convert our earth as a hope of the, as it was in the 2000s, we were barely an oil and gas hub in the world. Perth can convert itself as a hip hop of the hip hop of the world because all those projects can be done here. But the well, private finance are still looking at our industry as a high risk mm. because it's true. It's, there is a lot of research and development that have to be done. Engineering standards we need to transform and train a lot of people into this new economy. But I only see the governments as the only engine to do this, in my perspective. Well, post COVID, you see, the, you're dealing with politicians. You have to understand that politicians are a reflection of society. And we've had 80 years of prohibition and propaganda against hemp and cannabis. And so the politicians reflect that. And bearing in mind also that one of the concerns is, is if you put aside all the prejudice against politicians, genuinely politicians are there to help the people. At least that's what, what is felt. Now, if they are seen to be doing things which is going to damage society, they'll say, we're not going to do that. And if it can possibly lose votes and therefore you lose power, that's not going to be entertained. So we have to actually bring people to an understanding, uh, a better understanding. And that means we need to educate not just the politicians, but everyone in society. So everyone needs to be on board and we need to get a two pronged approach, which I'm focusing on. One is educating the population and increasing the anger in society. We need this. This is our, our wealth, our, our, our well-being. This is here, our, our future. And on the inside on politics, awakening the politicians to the concepts of we could improve the wellness, we could improve the wealth, we could improve the, 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 the health of the land. Uh, it's all of it is good. Therefore, we're going to do this. But the pressure from outside has to be there because otherwise the politicians are working in a vacuum. So post COVID, well, I do sense, I don't know if you sense senses, but I sense the COVID of all the many bad things it's done. One good thing has happened is that we are now in a new phase of understanding, a new phase of life. That the old ways have passed. We've got new ways in front of us. And so hemp can be part of that new movement. Absolutely. And many see hemp as the engine of the epicenter of that uh, change and that shifting. <clears throat> I believe I, as a Latino, uh, <laughs> um, I'm originally from Venezuela. Mm. Um, we lived a lot of transformations in the last 20 years. And when I first uh, was invited to join the party, I had my reservation because we already had the hemp party, that, 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 that was, but then I saw this great success that inspired me very much. And quite honestly, Mr. Brian, I do understand that educating the um, traditional politicians is the path, the peaceful path. I, and I believe that the real path is to bring more, to defeat the system with their own rules and get more parliamentarians representing cannabis for the real change. And that change will take much uh, less painful argument with people that are, with all due respect. I wrote an article some time ago that is referring the politician that the 100 uh, syndrome monkey. And I'm not sure exactly, I'm very sure that you are, you're very smart. What he, what he, he means like this, the politicians worldwide, this is no personal with anyone and they're not guilty neither. They have been repeating uh, or have been supporting a law that is wrong, uh, but they don't even know what they're supporting it. It's like the same monkey doesn't want to take the banana because he knows it's going to get a white spray, a cold spray, in, you know, in the body and he doesn't want to get that. It's not right. <laughs> we can become the economic hub of the Australasia region and become, and we all can benefit out of that huge and immense prosperity that the hemp industry can come primarily because it's the decentralized. 
you're not going to get one, three guys that have become millionaires and the others, you know, barely have to spend to it. That's a big difference. Huge potential there. I have to actually point out, uh, when I first went into Parliament, the people in our party were saying, you're only there to speak about hemp, uh, cannabis, nothing else. Uh, you are, it's only what you were elected for, there's nothing else you should speak about. And um, uh, we had a discussion about that uh, among ourselves. We said, but we're going to reject this because just focusing on cannabis is very, very limited. Cannabis use just now in our society, uh, apart from those who have the, 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 the interest, the money, the ability to, to use cannabis as a social drug, or the ones who are involved in, in look, looking at the business, the vast majority of cannabis use just now is uh, by people who are treating the problems that society hasn't treated. The doctors are not recognizing or treating mental health problems. Uh, there, there's a PTSD, there's domestic violence, there's uh, poverty, uh, homelessness. Uh, there's a tremendous pressures of simply existing and it's transgenerational and so people can then uh, choose uh, things like alcohol they can choose cannabis they can choose uh, other drugs the thing about this is alcohol we let them do that it destroys lives uh, and we, we, give, we give the help when people start taking cannabis we then criminalize them on top of everything else they've got that is who we need to be working with. So we have social policies here about how do we actually manage homelessness? How, I'm giving a budget speech uh, on the 26th of this month, a reply speech, where I'll be going into, uh, we need to look after our bottom line, but we need to do that by fixing the problems that lie at the root of this. So it's a much, much bigger problem than simply saying, well, cannabis smoking is good or bad. There's a wide range of things we need to address and being limited by people who've got a limited understanding is not good. So we as politicians have to set the path as we're the first. This is what we're going to do, set the example, not just for Australia, but for other countries that we're interested here in the wellness of the population, in the, well, in the wealth of the population, in the wellness of the country. Okay, so we are actually uh, the, the classical politician, we've got a broad range of interests. Cannabis is front and center, but it's not the only thing we do. And bringing this out there and saying to people, choose us, develop your, 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 your parties, uh, get your voters, vote for, for, for us, uh, it, whichever country you are, because that way we can begin to get change happening. Okay, the status quo is no longer tenable. Like I said, it's much easier to vote them out than arguing with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, look, Mr. Ryan, it's been a great pleasure having you with us. Your words resonate and getting a lot of uh, um, messages congratulating you. <laughs> 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 one, of, one of my business partners says that you are delighted. <laughs> 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 oh dear well, there's so many people here michael i see you as well uh, fantastic you uh, are lead have led the way and i hope to carry that baton and take it forward with you well you're doing a fantastic job man i'm really impressed you know you, your depth of knowledge of the plant is fantastic and your enthusiasm i love it <laughs> <laughs> yes um when I was uh, uh, invited to join the party, that's one of the things that pushed me back a little bit because um, cannabis is one plant. It's no hemp, it's no marijuana, it's both. Yeah. It is both, it's the way yeah. how you grow it. So yeah. this, this uh, segregation and just intending to call cannabis, substitute the word of cannabis for marijuana because it's coming for deprivation. Who cares? It is hemp is what it counts. You know, I got, before I came to the business as an engineer, I had to understood uh, uh, how many, how many we are, how many people we are actually there out there. So I, I you know, I'm crazy managing a lot of data. So, and I got a lot of numbers that I'm very happy to share with you. But there is, an, there is a number that called my attention uh, that is standard in throughout most countries on earth. There is a steady 10% of um, consumers of, of marijuana around the world. In any country, any country is the same. So that number is basically steady. That number is uh, at the same time, it's a valid number for um, uh, potential elections, future elections, to take strategically, strategically actions on this. 
My point here is that <clears throat> it's much easier to vote out the current politicians that, that educate them. It's not gonna happen. And coming from, from Latin American background, as an, ex, as an experience in politics, in Mexico and Venezuela, we had two ruling, ruling parties that were in governments for over 60 and 70 years, uh, respectively. There was a big movement such as the cannabis in Australia, the people gathered, and in one election, we pulled them out. We voted them out. Democracy works. I believe in democracy, but we really need to if we really want to uh, do the change, Mr. Brian, uh, this revolution is in, you are the light of that revolution because you and, 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 and this lady has achieved what is, has been impossible in 80 years in all countries on earth. It's possible, made possible because people believed in us and voted for us. We need more. Yes, yes. I don't know if we still have some uh, space for questions, uh, Kimi, or we have some people that wants to write some questions. Um, uh, um, Kimi? Okay, thank you for that. I, I'm just listening. I'm just, I'm just here. I'm just so uh, enamored with uh, with everything that Dr. Honorable Dr. Brian has said regarding the prohibition. And now he, as a doctor, his role in changing the minds of politicians and then changing um, helping other people um, understand that this is not just an issue of hemp or cannabis or marijuana. We cannot focus this as a, as a single issue because there's a lot of issues underneath this. And uh, like what Dr. Brian said, it can, I mean, especially post COVID, we have a lot of problems and, and hemp could be one of the, one of the solutions. We're not saying it's the only solution, but it is a solution. So um, do we have any questions from our participants? We now open the floor to questions because uh, Honorable Dr. Brian uh, has a very busy schedule changing the world. So yeah, let's take advantage of this opportunity to, to ask him. You know my friends call me the dishonorable Brian, so I, I don't stand on titles. <laughs> <laughs> I personally <laughs> met a Mr. Uh, uh, the son of Mr. Herrer, Dan Herrer. Dan Herrer was uh, <clears throat> uh, the father of the hemp revolution in the United States. Mm -hmm. He sacrificed his life to see this happening. Uh, he even changed himself to the Congress of the United States right before he, left, he died. So to make the politicians understand that this is the way. He told us that they will not understand. We have to vote them out. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to cut you, uh, Ramon. So we, have a, we actually have an interesting question from, from Bridget here. Um, she asked, what can we do about getting hemp processing facilities set up for hempcrete and hemp micronization as these machines are expensive for small growers? And I think that's a valid question. Well, yes, indeed. In fact, yesterday I was having a meeting with people who are doing just that. Now, um, uh, the Margaret River Hemp Company has got uh, a decorticator and um, the equipment they bought actually in from Serbia. This used to be technology that every village uh, in the Balkans had to make use of the hemp they were freely growing uh, for making their, their fabrics, for making their clothes. And yes, they are expensive. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, using uh, business centers. Uh, you could have the, the growers uh, producing and sending it for processing. So setting it up in WA, we already are doing this, uh, looking at uh, managing the, the hemp seed processing, the oils from that, uh, the, the, the hemp um, uh, crete itself, uh, using the, the, the decorticator and just processing the, the, the fibers. That's actually happening in Western Australia just now. And I'm sure in other parts of Australia too, but the machines are expensive. And so what we're looking for, what we're doing here is we're putting legislation to parliament next year 
where uh, we're going to look for legalizing cannabis and opening up the 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 the, uh, the, the broader approach to, to managing hemp because at the moment we can use a plant here a bit here a bit there a bit there but not the whole plant together it's very very difficult to to make that uh, 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 a proper business proposition now, once we have got those hurdles out of the way, then the growers can then work to getting a market. And there's many different markets. So what we're looking to do is to bring the people together. And I call myself a lighthouse. I'm not actually a doer. I don't grow hemp. I don't process it. What I can do is I can bring people together, draw, put the dots together. And once we're doing that, then business itself will work. And we're looking at the moment of actually spreading this throughout uh, at least WA so that people are able to have an outlet. For example, uh, getting the, the, the fiber for making uh, uh, hemp plastic, uh, fantastic idea. So it's, it's happening just now. Uh, once we get more in the way of a viable business going, then it is feasible to, uh, to afford the machines. But I would suggest the, the, the hand-driven ones you had in the village might not be very helpful unless you're making your own clothes or for a small market. So I'd be looking here at developing an innovative business where the processing is part of that structure, but there's many different levels and layers to it. I do agree with you, Mr. Brian. Um, my only... Um... Uh, advice or or adding value to this equation is the magnitude of what we are intending to do. We will not create a com uh, industry building a hundred house here or two hundred house here. It's not it's not even not even a competition. This is like a niche for the uh, uh, some personalities that can afford to build their own home, but that is not the reality of the common Australian or the common citizen of any country on earth. That's why I believe that the only way that to energize the, <clears throat> uh, the industry, either in Australia or anywhere else, is by building a city. City that will create that demand and people will simply follow. Because all products that will be um, uh, uh, manufactured will have one centralized market and people will follow. Western Australia is the only country or the only region that has the largest concentration of hempcrete homes on earth. I'm not sure if you were aware of that. In the United States, they're building, but a little bit here, a little bit there, all the way spread. The same in the rest of the world, Canada the same. Only in Australia, we have a large concentration. So, so the mentality is already there. The people are already aware but the actions are too slow to make it grow. And that's my understanding. Also, mm. on regards of the equipment, um, yes, that is very romantic, uh, with all due respect, uh, to have um, uh, uh, small uh, decorticators when the technology available has even artificial intelligence um, decorticators in the market. People that are engineers that are in my network that have already the design already in the market. So we have the technology, the war, our network have the technology to, to answer any demand that the market can actually uh, uh, request. We're ready to rock and roll, more than ready. Okay, um, and, and Bridget has a follow-up, uh, she has a follow-up here, she says, uh, there could also be work done in building code regu code regulations to make hempcrete hemp products more acceptable to the mainstream. Any comment oh, yes. on that? Doctor? Agree. Well, uh, indeed. I mean, uh, developing hemp. Uh, once we get the architects uh, working with the with the building engineers to to improve the hemp structure, absolutely. That we we have to do this. Absolutely, I agree with you. Okay. Um, we have another question here, and uh, this is actually from. Uh, this is from one of my colleagues from the Philippines. Um, he asked, how is law enforcement adjusting from looking at cannabis users as criminals into patients and business people? Mm. Well, uh, the problem is that once you uh, declare cannabis and, and hemp indeed as illegal, you automatically put it in the hands of criminals. So then everyone who uses this is automatically criminalized. The problem we have in Australia is that when I prescribe uh, uh, cannabis, uh, which has a bit of THC, if you detect even um, that because uh, THC can be in the body for many weeks after, after consuming it, 
If they have shown the presence of THC, they're equating that with uh, uh, impairment. Now that is scientifically completely wrong. Uh, there's no basis whatsoever for that. But what it means is that the police can now use the presence of THC as a proxy for impairment. They don't actually check impairment. They just check the presence of a substance. Right. Now, so this means there's no medical defense for driving with THC. Now, I showed this to the, the Premier and the Cabinet. They're considering it. This is uh, improper. And my committee is going to be investigating that. And I anticipate that barrier will be removed. But going uh, on, if I, may, if I may, Mr. Brian, what hmm. happened is that there is no technology to measure the quantity of THC in the system, and the governments are just more focused. Is just like you said, it's in the presence, and they're not interested in learning how much you have in your body. But it goes further than that. Well, if they're not testing for impairment. Where else are you not testing for impairment? You could drive with heroin in your system, uh, but they'll let you drive because uh, you say, I'm taking oxycodone but on a script, off you go. But, but you may be impaired, but they haven't tested for that. Uh, if you take cannabis immediately, so if you're going to smoke cannabis for four hours, you are going to be driving impaired. How much? Round about the same as if you're sleep deprived. How many people are driving sleep deprived and how many police officers are caring about the impairment? They're not. So it goes into occupational safety and health. How many people are being allowed to work on site who are impaired, but are not being detected as impaired because they haven't tested positive for THC. So therefore people are suffering injury and indeed death due to impairment, which hasn't been recognized. So this is, this is a very big thing. We're bringing this forward as well. Those are, those are major questions to ask. So uh, we need to change this all around. Uh, once we've legalized cannabis, uh, once we've legalized all aspects of hemp, then we can look at monitoring where is impairment. For example, in alcohol, uh, we have a limit here in WA 0.05. I know people on 0.02 who shouldn't be driving. So uh, do we want to actually stay with a measure or do we want to start testing for impairment? And that's a, that's a political question. That is very, very, very smart as well. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree, wow. I'm just, I'm just really listening here. Um, anything else to add, Ramon, before um, we have a comment here from James. Do you have anything to, uh, to add before I go in with the comment? I don't, I'm, I'm more, I, you're this also over Ryan's his answers <laughs> and his smart answers that are very holistic and very full of knowledge. Uh, Brian, I must congratulate you because, um, yes, uh, no mistake in that you are the boy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so before we praise more, uh, before we give him more praises, because I also have a lot of things to, to, to say, um, James says, uh, I think data collection is important. Is there any studies done, like how many people interested to own a hemp house, how much they are willing to pay for it or size of house is planned, points of concerns like fireproof or straight, et cetera. So this is on building already. Well, I can answer that one. Data collection is hugely important, uh, but also uh, you're not going to get much in the way of uptake because people don't know about these things. And so educating people about uh, hemp as being one of the building modalities is very important. If we were to focus on say sustainable environment, sustainable buildings, uh, you've got the rammed earth approach, the hay house approach, the, the, those, those uh, hay bale houses, hemp needs to go into that equation and uh, we need to also educate uh, um, our um, uh, architects because they are, and, and the building engineers because they are the ones who are going to be offering solutions. Uh, there's, there's two levels to this. One, of course, is for the bespoke housing where people say, yeah, I want a house which is top of the, uh, top of the line. Uh, the other uh, extreme is, say, of, of public housing. Uh, we have, uh, for example, the concern about indigenous housing in the north of, of, of WA. And we're offering them uh, prefabricated four by two houses, totally uh, uh, un, uh, uh, unsympathetic to the traditional way of life. And these houses are very destroyed. They're not lived. People live in the garage rather than living in the four by two. What we can do is we can get a, a process of growing your hemp, building your house and building it to your particular, building it to your, uh, to your uh, proper cultural norms and there we'd have a happier population uh, and a safer population and we wouldn't be imposing our standards on someone else's culture so that's very important so there's a wide range of options for that and everything in between of course as well that that is impressive actually um 
this is the first time I heard of this actually uh, from first time from a person uh, that you have to take in consideration the culture. So we are not actually just serving like uh, it's a one size fits all policy. It has to be like um, tapered to to the constituents. Um, and uh, I just want to give me heat, um, just to reinforce, reinforce Mr. Brian. Uh, perspective, I do fully agree with him. Our designs in Sydney are, doesn't have nothing to do with the ones in Puerto Rico or the ones mm -hmm. in Malaysia. Yes, you have to adapt to the environment and to the clients and <clears throat> especially to the availability of the materials at hand. Yes, yes. And uh, I also want to uh, to strongly emphasize again what, what, uh, what Dr. Brian said earlier that uh, he considers himself as a lighthouse. Um, I do believe that uh, he also said that uh, he thinks his role is like connecting people. And I think it's also the role that Ramon has, uh, has, uh, has taken on and myself as well. And uh, the concept being is the more we speak up, the more we encourage other people to speak up as well. And uh, we don't really have to be, of course, it's important to have like engineers and doctors and, and, uh, and professionals, but it's important for us to all get together because um, without us all getting together, because some people might think that their, their contribution might be very insignificant, but uh, the mere fact that we are educating, like in our own homes, friends, and small circles, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's working already. So um, yeah, Kimi, so whatever is happening, it's like, it's mind blowing. Kimi, I want to uh, also say that I congratulate uh, your the move that you did last week by registering this political party in the Philippines, where currently the prohibition uh, mentality is killing people in the streets just for the fact that they are uh, smoking weed. <clears throat> yes, thank you, thank you. And actually, uh, this uh, this is the first time it's been done in the Philippines, and I'm truly honored to be uh, chosen as the third nominee. And uh, like I said earlier, we have the harshest uh, laws against, uh, we, we have the harshest uh, drug war. So it's like putting ourselves out there and just like what doctor, what doctor did, um, he infiltrated the government. Like instead of like fighting the government, he actually went and he actually, um, he actually is now a lawmaker. And, and with, with that question in mind, uh, I would like to ask um, doctor, um, Actually, give me if I if I may just I'm sorry because go ahead in, please in military terms mm. Mr. Brian has done what the parachuters do he has been an airplane fly over the enemy enemy territory he he jumped he arrived in the in the territory enemy and this he is said, the enemy's here place. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so I was wondering about that, doctor. Um, uh, has it ever occurred to you before that you were going to join? Uh, you're actually going to be uh, in the government, um, being one of the like bearing the torch. H has it ever occurred to you before? I never really seriously thought that I would be a, a politician uh, because I was too busy being a doctor. I had plenty of opinions, I had plenty of views, I, I voted, I participated, uh, but I never thought, trusted myself that I could do this. Um, so cannabis actually opened this door for me and I'm very thankful for it. But now I've actually entered politics, I, it's strange, but I, I have this, this, this feeling, this, this knowledge that I'm actually in the right place at the right time. So uh, I've found myself actually leaving the medical side there as being a past life and now moving into a future. So what I'm seeing here is exciting me so much, uh, the moving into a new, a new phase of the world uh, and being able to play a small part in that is, is something I find very, very uh, moving. Yes. Um, That's, I guess, well, it's not... Uh, uh, Kimi, I guess uh, we have come to the conclusion of the time that uh, Mr. Brian has offered us for the interview. I am very grateful, Mr. Brian, your question, your energy, your determination. Um, let's vote the out. <laughs> <laughs> or as I say, uh, uh, the, the, the phrase that I wanted to make more popular is we are going to overgrow the government. Overgrow the government. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Overgrow the government. 
And, right. and, uh, oh, and as part of it, Parting word on my end, and I'd like to inspire everyone as well. Uh, of course, this is a reference to, to sparking and everything, uh, but I always love the term spark hope and let it ripple. So here we are just, just talking and we, we're collecting ideas and eventually all our ideas, if, uh, if we come together, these are, we're all going to make this into a reality. And it's really, I'm sorry, but um, I, I just can't help, but I'm really so excited to be speaking uh, with you today. Um, and yeah. Um, especially what Ramon said earlier that we are, we in the Philippines, we are trying that route. We are also going into the enemy's lair and we're going to win friends and we're going to make sure that um, we will help change the world for good. More power to you. Light Thank you, the, sir. Thank you. Light to the darkness. That's what cannabis yes. is all about. Light to the, to the darkness. Thank you very much, Mr. Brian. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for attending. Kimi, bye bye, all. You all. Namaste. Thank you so much. We all have a great Wednesday ahead and we will help change the world one hemp plant at a time. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you to everyone who joined us. And now we will be closing this session in Namaste. five, four, three, two, one. Have a great day, everyone. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.